Everybody awake after your workshops? Yeah. Okay, good, because I'm going to bore you with a history lesson. Uh, this is Ronald Belford Scott. He shares a birthday with Olaf's mum. He was born on the 9th of July, 1946. And he spent the first six years of his life in Kirimuir. For those of you that don't know, Kirimuir is a, a small town in the northeast of Scotland in Angus, about 20 miles uh, north of Dundee. Population is just under 5,000. Very pretty red sandstone town. Uh, music was a part of Bond's life from a very early age. Uh, we can see his dad, Chick, here in the middle row in the far left. He was a drummer in the local pipe band. Uh, he was also a member of the local light operatic society and took part in Gilbert and Sullivan productions. Uh, the family made the decision in 1952 that they were going to take up the offer and become £10 palms, and they moved the family to Australia, initially to Melbourne, and then finally settling in Fremantle on the West Coast. And here we can see Bond followed his father's footsteps and was a drummer in the Fremantle Plate Band. Uh, by this stage, Ronald had acquired the nickname that the world would know him as, uh, Bon, which came from Bonnie Scotland, from his Scottish roots. Uh, as the teenage years progressed, Bon kind of didn't fell out of love with the pipe band, but remained interested in music, and he, throughout the 60s, was actually in two different bubblegum pop bands, the Spectres uh, and the Valentines. And then moving into the 70s, we can see him in the far right here. He was in the hippie folk rock band fraternity. But it was in September 1974 uh, that he got the call from another couple of expat Scots, uh, Glaswegian brothers Malcolm and Angus Young. Uh, they were looking for a replacement singer for their recently formed band, ACDC. And it's with ACDC that he went on to have huge success. Uh, over the next seven years, he recorded and wrote seven albums with the band. Uh, the Scottish roots remained something very important to him. Uh, we can see here uh, one of the videos of the Long Way to the Top song, which is one of the few songs in rock that actually featured the bagpipes. Uh, and Bond sadly passed away in February 1980 after a night of heavy drinking in London. Uh, the album that he'd recorded just, uh, the, the album that he'd released before, Highway to Hell, had really broken the band in the States. And the album the band released after he died, Back in Black, is still to this day the second biggest selling album of all time. 50 million copies worldwide it sold. Uh, and ACDC, as I'm sure we all know, are still to this day one of the biggest bands on the planet. Um, I think Bond's legacy, if you look at the, the tour that ACDC have just finished, pretty much 50% of that set was made up of songs that were recorded in Bond's era that he wrote. 36 years after he died, still half of it was stuff that he recorded. So moving on 26 years from Bond's death in 1980, uh, community councillor in Kirimuir, Davy Milne, is sitting in the pub with a couple of mates, um, and he's hatching a plan. Kirimuir, I think, as has been mentioned already, uh, has got a close connection with J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. You can see in the town square here, we've got a statue of Peter in Pride of Place. Uh, but Davy thought we were neglecting one of our other famous sons. So um, in May 2006, this memorial plaque was unveiled in the town. Um, there was a reasonably good turnout. A couple of hundred people came to see it being unveiled. And there was a bit of entertainment during the day. And then the evening in the town hall, they had what at that stage was called uh, the Bon Scott Memorial Day concert. <clears throat> so that eventually morphed into what is now Bonfest, and we can see some pictures here over the years taken from the town hall. Um, the concert has generally featured, uh, the event has, has grown from one day to two days to three days now. Uh, we have tribute bands that come and play from all over the world. In recent years, we've had bands from Switzerland, Germany, Italy, Spain. Uh, we've also had, I think, four ex-members of the band and current members of the band who played as well. Chris Slade, who is the, the current drummer with ACDC, played a couple of years ago for us. And that takes us up to this year, which was the 10th anniversary of the festival. Uh, and the, for the first time, we really scaled it up to a proper full-size festival. Total attendance of 4,500 over the three days. <clears throat> Um, our audience has for many years been drawn from all over the world. Uh, you can see some of our German fans here. 
Uh, 27 different countries this year from as far afield as Australia, New Zealand, the US, Canada, and even one guy who travelled on his own all the way from Peru just to come to Kirimura for the festival. Uh, our German fans are without doubt uh, the, the largest foreign contingent we have. Um, they come every year without fail. And it really is a big Bonfest family because we have the same people come year after year. Um, and every year they bring more people and more people come. <clears throat> uh, we were very fortunate this year that uh, we were supported by Event Scotland's National Events Programme. Um, that grant funding really allowed us to, to scale up the festival and helped us deal with some of the issues of kind of cash flow that came in with it being a much larger scale. Without their support, we'd have really struggled. <clears throat> so you can see the, the difference in scaling up the festival was made to the income here. Um, 2014 was the first year that we moved to three days, but at that stage we were in the town hall, which was a capped capacity of £400 per day. The dip in 2015 is due to the fact that ACDC were touring that year, um, and we were a bit concerned that the, uh, we wouldn't get the audience over three days. That ended up being unfounded. We sold out in, I think, uh, two days. <laughs> sold the two days out in two days. So moving up to 2016, obviously, with the new capacity, uh, big tent, uh, I think it was 112,000 we took uh, with a profit ratio of, I think it was about 38%. Uh, looking ahead to next year, uh, we're going to be increasing the capacity again, and we've got a three-year plan where we're hopefully looking at total capacity of about six to 7,000 by 2018. <clears throat> um, a really important thing for us is the, the impact it has on the local community. Um, we, the only paid event is in the evening at the festival. During the day, we have uh, free entertainment on throughout the town. So all the local pubs have free music on. We have uh, outside stages that have free music. Uh, I think this year we had 47 different bands playing in the town over the course of the three days. Uh, and this means money is getting spent in the community. Local bars are making money. The hotels are obviously making money, but also shops are now selling souvenirs. The takeaways are making money from selling food. Uh, and our direct economic impact for our, our impact assessment this year was £403,843, which for a small town of 5,000 people is, is quite substantial. And the other thing we did this year <laughs> was we unveiled the Statue of Bonn. Uh, we had a three-year crowdfunding campaign, um, and we actually overfunded the crowdfunding campaign. We were looking for 50000 We ended up getting 55000 in the end. Uh, you can see the statue being unveiled here by Mark Evans, who was the, the bass player on four of Bond's, uh, the Bond era albums, and was a, a close personal friend of Bond. And Mary Renshaw, who has been described as Bond's soulmate, uh, and also the Bond Fest chairperson in the kilt there, John, rather happy. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just about the, the crowdfunding campaign, which was, again, it was a huge... PR boost for us as well. It's one of the, the main reasons we decided to really scale up the festival this year, because we knew we would get so much extra free press from the unveiling of the statue. Um, I think, I, I've, I can't remember what the worldwide figures were, but we, we've managed to track uh, coverage, press coverage in pretty much every country in the planet about this. Um, I'm going mad with Google Translate, trying to get Japanese sites translated and things. <clears throat> Uh, so the statue is now drawing people year round. This is a time lapse. This is a camera that this is pretty much the view I can see from my office in Kirimur. And it gets quite distracting some days because I can just see out of the corner of my eye and it's just a constant stream of people going to get their picture taken with Bon. Uh, and those people are coming into the town. They're spending money in the town. They're going up. They're having coffees. Um, the local shops are now getting on, on board. They're selling souvenirs and things. <clears throat> um, one of the local shops reported to me that since the statue went up, they've really capitalised that they're doing mugs, t-shirts, you know, everything they can. And uh, their local, their monthly takings have gone up by £1,000 a month since the statue went in. Uh, the local museum has had a record-breaking year already. I think their figures for October completely smashed any figures they'd had up until now with two months to go. So it's generating year-round tourism coming into the town. So finally, I'd like to say a wee bit about DD8 Music, which is the organisation I work for and that organises Bonfest. Um, DD8 Music was founded in 2005, the year before Bonfest started. <coughs> oh, excuse me. 
Um, and it was formed by a group of young musicians in Kirimir who were looking for a rehearsal space initially. Uh, so when Davy, who did the plaque, um, was looking for someone to, to do a gig, it was logical to come and speak to these young musicians to help out. So as the festival's grown, uh, DD8 Music has grown, and we can see some of our, our young volunteers here who uh, come and help out run Bonfest. So they're involved as volunteers. Um, they get some really great on-site work experience um, during the festival. Um, and the money that we make from the festival in turn helps fund the community work we do throughout the year. So we run a recording studio in Kirimir. Uh, from the recording studio, we currently offer five free uh, music-based uh, youth work sessions a week, covering everything from studio skills and recording, getting bands in to record their first demos, through to photography, video, um, and all the soft skills that go with kind of working as a team in, an, in, a, in a safe environment. Um, we do uh, several other uh, gigs throughout the year as well. This is a free life festival we do every summer that just gives the young bands a chance to get a bit of confidence performing live. Uh, we also support other community groups at their live events. So if a, if a group needs a PA or they need a disco done or they need some live music, we'll go along and help them, whether it's a charity event or it's the Cubs or the Scouts or the Brownies or something like that. Uh, from the very start, young people formed DD8, so it's been very important that we've had them on board uh, on, on the organising committee. Uh, we've always encouraged young people to stand for positions on the committee. Uh, here we can see Katie Reid, who has been involved with DD8 Music since she was nine years old. She's currently 19, and just last year she was elected chairperson of the organisation, so she's my boss. <laughs> That's just a wee video, just... DD8. Music initially was set up by a group of young people in Kirimir who were music lovers and were forming bands themselves and were just aware that there wasn't really any kind of structured activities in music in Kiri and they were keen to find a rehearsal space effectively. That was kind of the, the, the initial driving force behind it. One of the initial challenges was finding a space to begin with. Um, it took us actually quite a few years until we found this building. In the end it turned out to be absolutely ideal because it's We've no neighbours round about us, so noise isn't an issue, which with recording studios obviously can be a big thing. So we soundproofed the building ourselves um, and then equipped it, and obviously, and all, all that was made possible by the leader. Without the leader funding, we, it would have taken us forever to, to raise the kind of money to get set up initially. I play guitar at DD8. I've been coming here for about two and a half, nearly three years now. It's great fun. It started off with a lot of older guys, and I was learning from them. But as they've moved on with their lives and younger people have been joining, I've been starting teaching them and helping them along with what they've been doing. Music is great fun to do. You don't have to be really good at it to enjoy it. But if you just mix with others and play instruments, it's just great fun. The funding was absolutely essential in getting us set up and getting the building ready in the first place. But we're not reliant on grant funding now. We are pretty much self-sufficient. We have the the festivals that we run throughout the year generate enough income. We run the Bon Scott Festival, which celebrates Bon Scott, who was the original singer with ACDC. That's been a huge success. We have people come from all over the world. I think last year we had people from America, Canada, Australia, and just pretty much every country in Europe as well came over for that. Uh, so that's, that's fantastic for the town, brings people in from all over. In addition to that, we run the Live in the Den Festival, which is a free festival every summer down in the park, which is, again is great for the town because it brings people in from all over. And this year we're, we're setting up a third festival, which we're starting in May, which again should, you know, just get something happening regularly throughout the year. It's become a, a, a fantastic community facility. We're not just used by the young people that come in, we have adult bands that come in and use it for rehearsing. We have community groups that come in and use it for recording. We've had everything from bagpipes to poetry to spoken word stuff to be used in video presentations that we've had come in. We've got, um, uh, we've done link work with the, the high school as well. We've had high school kids coming down um, doing work in here. And uh, there's almost limitless potential for the kind of the different projects we can do here, and it's, it's growing all the time. It's great. <laughs> no one really judges you or makes fun of you for the way you dress, uh, who, who you are, your hair colour, sexuality, uh, race, what music taste you have. It's just a big embracing thing. 
<laughs> it's, it's, it's quite it's quite good. It's a nice it's a nice place with nice people. So we've had a wee bit of recognition in recent years for the youth work we carry out, which is always nice. Um, this is some of the team down at Media City in Salford last year, uh, where we won two awards at the Epic Awards for the Voluntary Arts, uh, including most exceptional project, youth work project. Uh, so, yeah, just to wrap up, some thoughts about where we're going in the future. Obviously, we've got all these people coming to Kirim year year round now, so. We're starting to hatch some plans about how we can capitalise on these year-round tourists. Uh, here you can see Mark Evans again with the, the display that's in the local museum. Um, some really quite rare ACDC artefacts in there. Now, 2011-12, Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in Glasgow held the Scotland's Family Jewels exhibition, which was um, the entire basement of Kelvin Grove Art Gallery was taken up with ACDC memorabilia. Uh, this was one of the most attended exhibitions in Kelvin Grove's history. Um, and it's clear evidence there's, there's a demand for this kind of music heritage tourism. So going forward, we're looking, maybe Kirimir needs a rock and roll museum. That's something we're thinking about, obviously with a focus on ACDC and Bonn, but there's the potential there for it to be something a bit wider than that, I think, maybe a live venue. Um, Early stages, but we're looking to get funding for a feasibility just study just now. Uh, we've got some sites in mind. And yeah, watch the space. So we're all set for next year's event, which is the 28th to 30th of April. Um, we've got possibly one of the best lineups we've had yet. So uh, yeah, maybe see some of you there. Thanks. <laughs>